Thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, thank you so much, Leslie and Omar, uh, also for all the conversations we had prior to today. I always wanted to do a, a talk at Cooper Union, so I'm really thrilled about that. Um, and, um, I, you know, I started to think of whether to talk about joy today would be fitting, given the circumstances that we are in. But after returning to the work, uh, I decided that perhaps it's very fitting to talk about joy today. So um, the talk that I will share with you is called Decolonial Joy, Theorizing from Valori Cambio, and basically has three overall uh, parts. Uh, first, I'm gonna describe to you the context of which this project arose, uh, Valori Cambio, which you could describe as an art project. Um, then I will uh, speak to what the experience of it was. And the third part uh, concerns uh, the concept of the colonial joy which emerged from this practice. Uh, it is often the case uh, in academia that people think about theorization as something that happens outside the work of art and it applied to it. Uh, but in this case, I very much feel that um, the theorization uh, came from the work instead of the other way around. Although, of course, later there was a dialogue of uh, multiple uh, theories and, and bodies of knowledge. So, the colonial joy, theorizing from Valori Cambio. On February 9, 2019, I co-launched Valori Cambio, which translated to English as value and change, in Puerto Rico, a Caribbean archipelago that has been subject to US colonial capitals rule for more than a century and increased neoliberalization since 2006. A pun on the Marxist concept of valor de cambio or exchange value, valor de cambio can be described as a storytelling, community building, and solidarity economy project that includes an interactive art installations and six bills of a community currency called Personas de Peso Puerto Rico, People of Weight Puerto Rico, or Pesos for short, as most people called it throughout the life of the project. A community currency or moneda social is a type of non-market money that is created and adopted by groups to value skills, knowledge, and talents, and facilitate their exchange. In general, community currencies do not replace the main currency, but offer ways to identify collective needs, strengthen local activity, and build economies that are not based on profit extraction or accumulation. There are over 5,000 community currencies circulating around the world. Spain alone has about 300. And here are three slides that uh, reference three particular currencies. Uh, this one is from Basque Country. This one is from Fortaleza, Brazil. And this one is the Tumin from Mexico. From the start, Valori Cambio had three core goals. One, to offer a widely accessible platform for participants to consider what they value. Two, to introduce the notion of community currency and three, to provide a practice of an exchange economy capable of fostering different social relationships. On the ground, Valori Cambio is a participatory and public experience. To take part, people approach a refurbished ATM machine that we call the VIC for Valori Cambio and speak into a camera and recorder for up to three minutes. The VIC asks participants to tell stories about what they value, how their communities can support what they value, and which people or groups are already sustaining these values. Participants may then exchange the bill for items at the partner businesses and organizations that agree to accept the currency for a period of time. Through these exchanges, Valori Cambio materializes an economy where the main unit of value is storytelling. In exchange for the story that participants tell the VIC, they receive a bill with a QR code that they may use to access the currency stories through their mobile phones. In exchange for this establishment accepting the pesos, the artists share their stories on social media. The need for a project such as Valori Cambio arose from a desire to combat Puerto Rican suffering resulting from what is generally called the debt crisis. A complex process rooted in over a century of colonial capitalism, which I could define as a logic of expropriation, extraction, and subordination that serves the interests of global capital through colonial practices. Its immediate trigger was the 10-year phase out from 1996 to 2006 of Section 936 of the U.S. Internal Revenue Code. Originally approved in 1976, 
The measure was designed to guarantee high profit margins to American corporations by extending tax breaks to companies that operated in Puerto Rico. In 1996, however, Congress abolished the tax exemptions to fund an increase of the minimum wage state side, inducing a wave of plant closings, the loss of over 100,000 jobs, and a deeper recession in Puerto Rico than that experience in the United States. The crisis deepened when, in 2015, Governor Alejandro Garcia Padilla announced that as a result of extensive borrowing to offset these shortfalls, the island's government had amassed such an enormous public debt, US 72 billion in addition to 50 billion in pension obligations, that it was, in his words, unpayable. A year later, the US Congress responded by passing the Oversight Management and Economic Stability Act, which returned Puerto Rico to a direct form of colonial capitals rule. This 2016 federal law created a fiscal control board composed of people with deep ties to the banking industry, including entities directly involved in producing the debt, and granted them broad powers to extract payment by privatizations and cuts to all of life's fundamentals, including healthcare, education, infrastructure, and pensions. As a result of these policies, close to 500,000 people have migrated. There are actually now over 5 million people, Puerto Ricans, living in the United States. The suffering reached a breaking point after September 16, 2017, when Hurricane Maria, a Category 5 storm, made landfall in Puerto Rico. Maria demolished the archipelago's decrepit electricity network and other infrastructure, leaving half a million residents with damaged or destroyed homes and an energy blackout that lasted almost a year. The political aftermath was no less devastating. It ushered in disaster capitalism and a necropolitical response by the state that resulted in hunger, homelessness, the death of at least 4,645 people, and the migration of another 100,000 residents, about 4% of the population. Poverty rates soared to near 50%. Following the hurricane, it similarly became evident that la crisis is not a temporary predicament. It is instead the symptom of a new mode of colonial capitalism. Since the United States invaded Puerto Rico in 1898, different sectors of US capital have subjected the island to three forms of colonial capitalist extraction. The first one, agricultural from 1898 to 1945, manufacturing from 1945 to 2006, and now neoliberal debt since 2006. Each has been injurious in its own way. Agricultural extraction ruined Puerto Rican landowners, expelled peasants from the land, and created single crop monopolies. Manufacturing modernized the economy and expanded the middle, gla the middle class, but it was predic predicated on extensive structural unemployment and mass migration of the so-called surplus population. In some ways, the newest modality may be the worst. Its goal is not only to extract profit, or push out labor, but also to found an empty island, a process that requires an even greater takeover of land and population expulsion than the prior periods. To the extent that Valori Cambio remains an ongoing project that includes a final tour in Puerto Rico, a report of the recorded stories, and a documentary, it is impossible to presently draw definitive conclusions on its effects or impact. However, at this point, I have found it urgent to reflect on two unexpected outcomes of the project. The joy that greeted it and the community currency initiatives that it immediately inspired. In retrospect, this reception anticipated the so-called hot summer, mass protests, and subsequent people's assemblies that erupted a few months later across Puerto Rico and its diaspora, and raised a range of questions regarding the centrality of emotion to both politics and art. Valori Cambio likewise generated a concept that I will formally introduce here and which may be increasingly relevant, relevant as anti-neoliberal protests spread throughout the world, the colonial joy. If the austerity crisis and post-Maria abandonment represent a larger context for Valori Cambio as an artistic intervention, the project's design largely stemmed from unpayable debt, capital violence, and the new global economy, a working group that at Columbia, uh, a working group that I co-led at Columbia University Center for the Study of Social Difference from 2016 to 2019. 
On payable debt's goal was to pursue comparative work and collective action against the imposition of debt as an extractive regime and form of governance. The working group included members and affiliates who were scholars, journalists, artists, activists, and students, none of whom were formally trained in economics. This last characteristic proved critical to the development of Valori Cambio, as it prompted us to draw from multiple methods and perspectives and to conclude that debt structures all aspects of our lives beyond those considered to be narrowly economic, including subjectivity and forms of political organization. Specifically, Valori Cambio's concept started to cohere as a result of at least three clarifying moments. The first took place when Vanessa Perez Rosario, scholar and managing editor of the journal Small Acts, interviewed me about unpayable debt work and asked me to think about a concept that I had not devoted much time to before, money. What is it? How does it, require, how does it acquire value? How can money be disruptive? In the process, I realized that while money itself was nothing, it told stories, signified values, and facilitated a range of human relationships. Even further, I came to view that the creation of money can serve as a means of fostering political resistance and invite trust in alternative political projects, in the words of anthropologist Beth Nora. The second moment was the knowledge that a few years after the 2008 financial crisis, the government of Ireland facilitated a conversation about what people valued as a way to rethink aspects of the nation's educational curricula and produce new social relations. This led to another set of key questions that recontextualized the prior ones about money. If in a debt crisis, there is not only the challenge of less resources, but also of how to use existing resources, how do polities and communities determine what they will support? In other words, what do they value? How do these values orient power and policy? The last moment involved art. In May 2018, I curated a show called Puerto Rico Underwater, Five Art Perspectives on the Debt Crisis at the Center for the Study of Ethnicity and Race at Columbia University. Early on, our working group had identified the arts as an important practice in context of neoliberal crisis globally, including in Argentina, Brazil, Greece, Mexico, and Spain. The curatorial process confirmed how in Puerto Rico, art was investigating fundamental aspects of the debt not addressed by the majority of scholarship, including the affect and surrealness of debt and money itself. The process likewise made me more aware of the work of Sarabel Santos Negron, one of the artists included in the exhibit, who had produced a series of photographs of objects left behind in increasingly abandoned landscapes, or what I termed the debris of the austerity crisis. After the show, I reached out and asked if she would be interested in collaborating or what I began to call the Puerto Rican money idea. She agreed. One of the most complex and time-consuming parts of Valori Cambio was the imagining of a new currency. To conceive it, Santos Negron and I worked for almost a year to develop the initial series of six banknotes, which featured one, two, five, 10, 21, and 25 denominations. During this period, we studied art, national and community currencies from all over the world, particularly those of islands, which tend to employ a broad color palette, visualize a rich sense of place, and include a greater diversity of people than the US dollar. To select what stories the bills would tell, Santos Negron and I conducted an informal survey of people living in Puerto Rico and the diaspora. We asked them, what persons, communities, or places both embodied the four core values that we had adopted for the project, equity, solidarity, justice, and creativity, and allowed us to discuss critical challenges of the present, such as access to healthcare, education, and land, racism, sexism, and migration. After considering the responses, we selected an iconic community and nine non-living figures who practice a wide range of politics. To, create, to avoid creating a hierarchy among them, we assign a chronological order to the denominations, beginning with those born in the 18th century through to the 20th. Ultimately, the currency highlighted the siblings Gregoria, Celestina, and Rafael Cordero, Black and Christian pioneers of public education in the early 19th century, Ramon Emeterio Betances, an early promoter of public education, abolitionist, and anti-colonial organizer, anarchist, feminist, and labor organizer, Luisa Capetillo, social justice activist and poet, Julia de Burgos, humanitarian and baseball star, Roberto Clemente, Amarangelis Torres Morales, Gerald Constanzo, and Cristal Heger Ramirez, three young leaders selected by the eight Caño Martin Peña communities, the only in Puerto Rico to collectively own their land, 
to represent their story. To bring awareness to the politics of storytelling and the importance of imagination to politics, we also introduced story elements that were not widely known or missing from the official archives. For instance, the one peso bill included composite drawings of Ra Rafael Cordero's sisters, who despite their contributions to the public education of girls, have been largely ignored by scholars and national narratives. We likewise use unorthodox numbers for the currency, such as the 21 in the Clemente denomination. This gesture was meant to not only note Clemente's exceptional career as a baseball player, but to signify that stories are complex, do not have to come in multiples of five, and that monetary policy could effectively be in our hands. The creation of the Caño Martin Peña bill, number 25, also allowed the project to engage with a largely unremarked paradox. The bills were designed to foster localized solidarity economies, yet most of the figures, while diverse in multiple senses, were already incorporated into national narratives. This tension between local and national seemed unavoidable if the goal was to have a broad dialogue across the Puerto Rican archipelago. But to address this inconsistency, the 25 bill underscored the importance of local economies, participatory forms of governance, and collective land tenure. Following our own rule, we narrated the Caño Martin Peña's birth in the 1930s, making it the last bill in the series. Tellingly, the fact that this bill had the highest denomination and featured living young people was generally understood by the public to most clearly exemplify the project's critique to neoliberal capitalism and desire for a different present and future. Despite living in the era of Bitcoin and other digital currencies, we chose to create a paper currency that can be passed from hand to hand as we thought that this would enable conversations and facilitate the circulation of stories. So to test this idea, in January 2019, we took some early currency prototypes to farmers markets in Ato Rey and Umacao. We quickly discovered three things. One, that the bills indeed served to tell stories and that the stories were meaningful. Two, that very few people had ever heard of the term moneda social before our meeting, but re readily grasped the concept of an exchange economy. And three, that it often took less than a minute for most to agree to participate. This early level of support was remarkable, as we were basically suggesting to small business owners that they may potentially lose money and waste time for more than a week. Significantly, many of those who agreed without hesitation were women who offered two key reasons for their support. One, exchange economies were familiar. In the succinct words of a farmer from Umacao, exchange is how women take care of their families. Of their families. Two, exchange economies and other forms of autogestion or self-governance is how countless Puerto Ricans survived after Hurricane Maria an experience that was still fresh in people's minds. At Rima Brul, the owner of the Averdura in Old San Juan, the project's first site recalls, here in my restaurant, we started operating right away. Everyone brought what they had and we cooked. This is consistent with how during an austerity crisis, women are particularly pressured as they are tasked with social reproduction and care of family and community in precisely the areas undermined by austerity policies, such as education and health. A month later, however, not all business owners or organizational directors agreed to participate. Several declined out of fear that community currencies were illegal or a scam. Others, including some of our own team members, had concerns that the state would retaliate against participating organizations or even arrest us. Regardless, the decision was made to take the risk. After nearly a year of planning and with the ultimate support of 42 businesses and organizations that agreed to accept the bills, Valori Cambio hit the road. Over the course of eight non-consecutive days from February 9 to February 17, the VIC visited five locations, two public schools, and a youth leadership program. From the first day, the public reaction surprised everyone. Hundreds of participants stood in line for hours until evening, rain or shine, to obtain a bill. A number of people came every day, and others every time that they could. On the last day of the project in the city of Bayamón, the VIC was open for 14 hours until midnight to honor the petition of people who worked as cooks, waiters, and bartenders in the area who wanted to participate after the shifts ended. Immediately, the outcome begged the question. As the line to obtain the bills was not to access fuel, a job, or even a concert ticket, why was this happening? What made the wait worth it? Immediately, one thing became clear. It was not for the money. At least it was not for the exchange value of the bills. In a country suffering from a profound austerity crisis, 
The vast majority of people who participated, more than 1,000, did not utilize the currency. Of the dispensed 1,600 bills, which amounted to thousands of dollars, less than 100 bills totaling 150 pesos were used. Instead of circulating the bills for the exchange of products or services, participants exchanged ideas, broke down into tears or smiles when they obtained the bills, and asked, how could we keep this movement going? As I engage with participants each day, I heard a host of reasons for why people retain the bills. Not a few said that they did so because the project and the bills were works of art and that they were beautiful. Others held on to them because the bills affirmed their identities, not only as Puerto Ricans, but as women, blacks, young people, and residents of El Caño. Yet for another group, the bills represented the end of colonial capitalism and the possibility of a new beginning. Not surprisingly, numerous people returned to the VIC again and again to repeat the experience and obtain a different bill, which recalls theologist Ruben Alves' verse, for in each repetition, the beauty is reborn, new, fresh. That hundreds of participants opted to keep the bills could appear as a form of hoarding. Yet the politics of the Puerto Rican response are complex. On the one hand, that participants understood the bills as art was in itself politically meaningful, as artists are often more valued than political figures for their role in maintaining cultural memory and reproducing collective identity under colonialism. On the other, unlike citizens of a nation state, which has its own currency, Puerto Rico has never had a national currency and has been subject to US colon colonial capitalism and its symbolically loaded currency, the dollar, for over a century. Equally significant, the U.S. dollar is not only that of another country and a colonial power with complete control of Puerto Rico's monetary policy and federal money, money allocations, it similarly enshrines the coloniality of power, that is, the long-standing patterns of power that emerge as a result of colonialism, but that define culture, labor, intersubjective relations, and knowledge production well beyond the strict limits of colonial administrations, in the words of philosopher Nelson Maldonado Torres. This is evident in that the dollar contains only figures of men who identify themselves as white, are representatives of the state, and or agents of racist, genocidal, and heterosexist policies. In this context, the idea of a local currency created for communal well-being, which operated by exchange and circulates images and stories of women, blacks, migrants, and children of immigrants, writers, doctors, educators, athletes, thinkers, feminists, union organizers, individuals, but also families and communities, disrupted the manner in which Puerto Ricans are discounted daily by the U.S. currency in political, economic, and cultural terms. It likewise affirmed a range of stories, perspective, and political praxis as valuable and underscored that there are other ways of counting and telling. And it did so using the most powerful discursive and economic symbol of U.S. colonialism in Puerto Rico, money. To rejoice at the currency was then to challenge multiple layers of dispossession. To the extent that this stage of the project lasted only eight days and there was doubt that it could ever be extended or repeated, the majority of participants opted to keep the bills as a symbol of communities, of struggles, of memory, of beauty, of hope. If money is a promise of payment and the body that imposes austerity in Puerto Rico was created by a law called PROMESA, the peso is a very different kind of promise, which is why for many, the value of the bill exceeded what could be exchanged with it. The peso was, in addition to beautiful or valuable, a piece of each participant's desires and history, which which they refused to part or transact. But even before I asked participants why they were not using the bills, and I heard their reasons, I witnessed an emotion that was not entirely new to the project, joy. Countless times, several months before the machine first touched the ground, I too felt joy working on Valor y Cambio. This emotion was one that I seemed to communicate to people who visited the tour locations. Day after day, I spoke to participants who thanked me for the project. Significantly, they did not thank me for my work, which is what normally people say or do, but por tu alegría, for your joy. At times, I distrusted this joy. For all joy is not good or intends to do good. Joy, writes theologian Miroslav Wolf, can be self-absorbed. Joy can be indifferent to others. Joy can be perverse. I rejoice in the misfortune of others. Moreover, as philosopher Slavoj Žižek has argued, if enjoyment coheres national identity through the notion that others want to steal a group's enjoyment and corrupt them with theirs, joy can lead to violence, 
violence against the foreign other and fake subjects into the existing framework of domination. Yet without ignoring the above complexity, the explosion of joy that greeted the project often went beyond ethnic affirmation and its pitfalls. Joy appeared at the precise moment when many, myself included, felt the possibility of a different now, one where neither colonialism nor coloniality ruled over our lives. While this reaction is not free of fantasy in Zizek's sense, meaning the imaginary relation to the other, not all political fantasies are the same or are equally generative. This realization immediately raised two additional questions. Could this widely shared response that so pervaded Valori Cambio's inquiry into value in the so-called oldest colony in the world be described as not only joy, but a specific kind, decolonial joy? And if so, what does the concept make political possible, politically possible and how to define it? Although joy is one of the most fundamental of human emotions, theorizing the politics of joy in general and decolonial joy in particular is not without difficulties. First, decolonial is often defined as the antithesis to coloniality, which in scholar Joseph Drexel Dry's words refers to the cultural and epistemological frameworks, including the ontological, for example, gender and racial, theological and social imaginaries generated during the political process of colonialism, which have yet to disappear after political decolonization. In the case of the Puerto Rican archipelago, a formal colony, the reception to Valori Cambio raises the question of whether what I'm referring to as decolonial joy would not be better described as anti-colonial or even national joy. That is, a joy fundamentally springing from a desire to replace the colonial nation state, found a new nation state or affirm national sovereignty rather than disrupt the matrix of coloniality. There's no doubt that some participants' joy could also be described in this way. Not a few cried at seeing the currency because holding it in their hands made them feel as, I quote, Puerto Rico was already an independent country. However, to the extent that the inhabitants of Puerto Rico have been subject to colonialism and coloniality for over 500 years, and many Puerto Ricans today are ambivalent towards nation state building, due in part to the fear that this process may bring not less but greater coloniality in the hands of a white and male elite, the decolonial imaginary appeared to be more widely shared. In this regard, for decolonial joy to prevail in a formal colonial context is, among other things, to insist on the necessity for a decolonial politics on a, under any configuration of state power. Second, while it is arguably impossible to talk about love without joy, decolonial theorists have to date almost exclusively focused on love. This is evident in the works of a wide range of theorists, such as Chela Sandoval, Drexel Dries, and Maldonado Torres. For Sandoval, who coined the term decolonial love, is simultaneously a technology of social transformation and a category of analysis that can be defined as an attraction and a relation carved out of and in spite of difference. Engaging with both Fanon and James Baldwin, Drexel Dries views decolonial love as a tool, method, and hermeneutic to shatter the structures of colonial modernity and foster the reconstruction of a world that allows for a new way of being human, eclipsing current hierarchies within a modern colonial world. The notion of joy, however, is not altogether absent from the colonial theory. In his work on beauty and art, philosopher Enrique Dussel has argued that the joy of being alive is in the substance of all possible aesthetics and art. Although not fully theorized, the term itself is briefly mentioned in scholar Dean Itsuji Sarnilio's book on sustainable empires, alternative histories of Hawaii statehood. The concept appears in a passage discussing theories can dance Fujikani notion of settler ally in relation to ea, which in this context refers to both life and sovereignty. The term settler roots us in the settler colonialism that we seek to rearticulate, says Fujikani. At the same time, the term encompasses the imaginative possibility for a collaborative work on ea and land-based decolonial nation building, for there is joy too in these practices. We move ourselves to the decolonial joy of practicing ea. Overall, influential feminist scholarship in the Americas and Europe has devoted limited attention to joy, generally favoring pleasure or anger as key categories. Tellingly, Sarah Ahmed is one of the most prominent feminists invoking joy, albeit as a negative positive, kill joy. In her words, there can be joy in killing joy, and kill joy we must and we do. 
Whereas one could argue that the colonial joy is a killjoy of coloniality, Ahmed's main target is actually happiness, which he at times conflates with joy, thus assuming that killjoy is the, kill joy is the reverse of happiness. Yet I would argue that joy is not the same as happiness, can be perfectly compatible with not being happy, and can be experienced with greater intensity in relation to pain. I will return to that. A more akin genealogy stems from the work of black feminists who invoke joy as a politics. Her influential text uses of the erotic, writer Audre Lorde linked joy to the life source of the erotic and the possibility of connection across difference. As Lorde writes, the sharing of joy, whether physical, emotional, psychic, or intellectual, forms a bridge between the shares, which can be the basis for understanding much of what is not shared between them. Contemporary Black feminist activist Adrienne Marie Brown has likewise argued for joy as a form of resistance and community. Finding ourselves, she says, finding each other, finding our fight and our joy, that's what this moment is about. In various ways, Black feminist joy, decolonial love, and Fujikani's conceptualization of joy as a decolonial practice of life and communal politics provide valuable entry points into the possibilities of decolonial joy. At the same time, to the extent that in all these contexts, joy is not at the center of reflection, leaves a range of critical questions unexplored. To address some of these gaps in the next section, I will expand the dialogue between valor y cambio and several theories of joy. Through this counterpoint, I will focus on the temporality, temporality, pain, and tensions of decolonial joy and broaden the scope of questions one may ask about this concept and praxis. To the extent that Valori Cambio was a temporal experience, it is, useful, it is useful to begin with describing when joy was felt by the participant. It was not waiting in line, although people reported that they enjoy speaking to others. It was generally not during the recording, no exchange with the Vic, although some people had emotional responses to telling their story, including crying and laughter. It was generally at the exact moment when participants received the bills from the dispenser, particularly when they obtained the figure they hoped for. This temporal dimension of joy recalls philosopher and theologist Thomas Aquinas' observation that joy is a response to having been united with what we love. One of the most compelling examples of what one may call the moment of joy was that of a young artist and teacher, Eduardo Paz, who stood in line for hours for several days because he wanted to receive one particular bill, the one featuring the Cordero siblings. When he finally did on February 19, I asked Paz why this bill brought him so much joy. Let's say that if I talk, I will cry, he said. Cordero was an educator. Basically, it represents what I am, an Afro-descendant man fighting, educating, and showing its roots to the different situations that life can present. This bill is worth a lot. Pues digamos que si hablo voy a llorar. ¿Por qué? ¿Por qué tan emotivo? O sea, cuéntame. Es un educador. de las distintas situaciones que puedan presentar la vida y vale mucho. As suggested by past experience and commentary, this rejoicing was not a passive act. In order to obtain the bills, participants had to engage in a series of interactions that required time, effort, and mental investment. But even without this particular design, to experience joy requires what Rawls described as the construal of the ob object of joy as good. It is tied to how I perceive things rather than to what things are in themselves. In other words, to feel joy, a subject will need to actively imagine relationship to him or herself, as well as to other objects and subjects, and determine their value. Consistently, Path's reaction underscored that there was joy in the story that the bill told and the possibilities the story opened. In his case, the joy was in contrast to Du Bois' concept of double consciousness. It was the joy of at least a dual valorization, 
his valorization of Rafael Cordero, a black educator in the 19th century, and the project's public valorization of Cordero and all of who, like him, are black educators. This convergence gave a particular content to past joy, that for a moment, the world valued what he valued and the world valued him. This recalls Wall's observation that joy can be defined as an emotional attunement between the self and the world, usually a small portion of it experienced as a blessing. At another level, past joy is a story of black educators. Is about, uh, I'm sorry, at another level, past joy in the story of black educators is about asserting people's individual and collective capacities under conditions of colonialism and coloniality that continuously attempt against their thriving. This dimension recalls philosopher Baruch Spinoza's notion of joy as a concept of resistance that arises when a subject is able to actualize his or her capacities and, in his words, persevere in its own being. Or as philosopher Gilles Deleuze put, Deleuze put it, you experience joy when you satisfy, when you effectuate one of your capacities. Joy that not only implicates a world, but also assumes a politics, that is, a field of power. As Nietzsche has observed, there is a temporal desire in joy. He says, all joy wants eternity, wants deep, wants deep eternity. In other words, if joy is what is missing, it wills itself as a permanent state of justice. Furthermore, as Wolf elaborates, in this willing, joy sets itself tacitly against features of the world over which one cannot or should not rejoice and does so without resentment and judgment. The ways that the bills prompted joy, however, does not exhaust the question of temporality and history. Participants frequently commented that the project had been successful because it came at the right time. And this assessment returns us to the historical juncture of the project and one of the paradox paradoxes of joy, or how joy is felt alongside or in counterpoint to pain, suffering, or mourning. Whereas the moment of joy was the embodied experience of receiving the bills, the time of joy, related to the larger context that renders such an object, an occasion, a gift. In the case of Valor y Cambio, joy emerged as the most common emotion to greet the project due to the collective suffering that Puerto Ricans had been experiencing for over a decade. It was the triple pain of the austerity crisis, Hurricane Maria, and the migration of so many Puerto Ricans that made our project's assertion of capacity and love feel like a blessing. In other words, the exuberance of joy was not despite suffering, but because of it. Joy, as literary scholar Matthew Mutter has observed in his work on WB Yeats, is not only inseparable from loss and suffering, the most intense, intense joy may emerge from challenges to joy, even catastrophe. The term catastrophe is critical. As I've, 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 I have argued elsewhere on the trope of the emptying island, what Puerto Rico has been exp experiencing is catastrophic. But I use the term catastrophe not as simply a synonym for disaster. Instead, I propose to build on literary scholar Alexander Perisic's observation that catastrophes, a term derived from the Greek meaning to overturn, can be understood as a moment of overturning in which collective reflection and action are possible. In other words, facing the disaster of colonial capitalist modernity, Puerto Ricans have brought about catastrophe or overturning. The joy produced by participating in Valor y Cambio in Valor y Cambio, thus envision the potential of both decolonial joy in the present and a joyful decolonial future. This is consistent with Wolf's observation that joy is best experienced in community. Joy seeks company. It is likewise present in Nietzsche's question about how humanity will assume strength in the face of the tragic nature of life through revenge or communal joy, and his answer, to share not suffering, but joy. It is similarly consistent with sociologist and Mish's observation that joy comes from the immersion in and enjoyment of simultaneous motion forward in time and across social space. In this sense, while some participants appear to enjoy the fetishization of the bills or the affirmation of our Puerto Rican national thing, others related their joy as part of the process of founding an expansive decolonial politics. It's for neuroscientists such as Antonio Damasio, joy is an embodied emotion and feeling is the perception of a certain state of the body along with the perception of a certain mode of thinking and of thoughts that weave in emotion with memories and meaning, the colonial joy signifies more than a particular emotion. The cognitive process to envision the coloniality also assigns meaning to joy and materializes a feeling for justice. In other words, what I call the colonial joy is the active manner by which people become aware of, reason with, and connect 
the emotion of joy to a desire for decolonial justice. Akin to what Damasio calls the satisfaction of seeing justice served, decolonial joy encompasses and connects both emotion and feeling to redress pain, suffering, and anger. Joy, however, was not the only concept used to describe how people felt at receiving the bills. In interviews and conversations with particip participants, many expressed that they would be keeping their bills because they bore hope. As farmer and activist Jana Muriel put it, Valerie Cambio brought hope in a time when most was lost. I believe that farmers and elaborators can organize to create a local currency which can meet the specific needs within the market. In theory, joy and hope are often at odds. Mish has observed that hope is a future-oriented discourse, which unlike joy, is based on the not yet. Tellingly, Spinoza views hope as an ambiguous and problematic notion. Hope is nothing else but an inconstant pleasure, arising from the image of something future or past, whereof we do not yet know the issue. Even further, for Ahmed, hope is reactionary. To the extent that hope is a promise of future happiness, it can express a melancholy for a lost object and constitute a form of control that keeps subjects to stay in place. Still, in Valori Cambio, the yo of the present, the connection to a past and the possibility of a more just future were at times intertwined. Recalling Alves' conception of hope, not as deferment, but as a knowledge that actions in the present may only completely flourish in the future. In his words, let us plant dates, even though those who plant them will never eat them. We must live by the love of what we will never see. This is evident in how some participants found hope and joy in how the project facilitated their own initiatives. In this sense, the colonial joy inspired a greater ease in the capacity to act rather than postponement, which is perhaps why decolonial joy has been sustained over time, giving rise to another unexpected outcome, the rapid emergence and consolidation of community currencies and solidarity projects. The first example is the Caño Martin Peña communities, which began to design their own community currency, the first in Puerto Rico, after our project ended the initial tour. In late 2018, I visited El Caño to ask permission to tell their story in our 25 peso bill. After a brief conversation, El Caño representatives said that they had an immediate use for alternative currency. To learn more, El Caño asked to be included in Valori Cambio's tour, and the project visited the community's farmer's market, Mercado Agro Artesanal Barrio Obrero Pati, on the third day. Finally, on October 1, 2019, El Caño launched its own currency, the Pasos, or Steps, del Caño Martin Peña. The pasos are so named as they will be issued to residents whose actions allow the community to step closer to their goals. A second project is that of Just Exchanges in New York, a collaboration with activists Libertad Guerra and Angel Lopez, supported by the Ford Foundation. The project consolidated after Valori Cambio visited the center and the Nathan Cummings Foundation to be part of the, of the Pasado y Presente Art After the Young Lords exhibition in May 2019, curated by Guerra and Yasmin Ramirez. Just Exchanges aims to create a citywide community currency and solidarity economy networks among various communities in the city starting this year. Of course, not all was joyful. While joy was widely shared and experienced, what made people joyful was often different, at times in conflict. For instance, a small number of people who participated in the project apparently did so with the main objective of cashing in on the colonial joy. For them, the currency was, not, was if not real money, an object which could and should be converted into a quick profit. Unsurprisingly, in less than 48 hours, at least two people were selling the pesos on the eBay platform for as much as $125, leading to intense arguments online between sellers and other participants. Comments in relation to the two most visible press items on the project similarly show that conservatives and internet trolls did not experience the colonial joy, but colonial capitalist disgust. Of the over 400 comments left on a Nuevo Dia and Telemundo's website under Valori Cambio coverage, the overwhelming majority were insults to the artists and mockery of the idea that Puerto Ricans could ever have a valuable currency or have a thriving economy without the United States. For many in this group, the bills represented a rival authoritarianism or communism and the short destabilization of the status quo, U.S. hegemony, and their way of life. Equally important, although the expressions of joy appeared alike, their political locations were diverse, underscoring the complexity of joy as a politics, decolonial or otherwise. Moreover, gauging from the many conversations that spont spontaneously occurred throughout the tour, people's visions of what a decolonial future is or may look like 
and the conceptual and political frameworks guiding them were not only different, but sometimes at odds. Easily recognizable political reference included nationalist, feminist, anti-racist, anarchist, populist, labor, queer, and Marxist. Given this, there is no guarantee that what the majority enjoys correlates with an autonomous, non-hierarchical politics, or that decolonial joy will turn into a feeling of justice that encompasses everyone. This raises the question of the durability of decolonial joy on an actual political terrain. If decolonial joy, as all joy, as Nietzsche would have it, seeks eternity, what to do with the various temporalities and locations of decolonial joy? That is, if there is no decolonial joy, but rather multiple forms of radical joys, how does one sustain the other? Part of the answer may lie in the ability of the joyful subject to share his or her specific form of joy, which recalls both Sandoval's notion of decolonial love and Lord's black feminist joy. In both cases, joy and love could be capable of bridging difference, although not all difference at all times. Still, while questions remain in conceptualizing decolonial joy, as these words attest, for those of us who felt it, all we have wanted to do since then is to pass it on and on.